have this innate, inbred fear of sharks and being bitten by them. But is this really a reality? Should we have this fear factor? <clears throat> this is a map of the distribution of shark bites around the world. And it's really amazing that in 430 years, there have only been 2,500 shark bites recorded as unprovoked shark attacks. It's around the entire world. That's an average of only six shark bites a year, and one of those being a fatality. Now, sure, in uh, recent times, as people have spent more and more time in the water, and as there are more numbers of people in the water, that average has actually increased to around about 12 shark bite fatalities a year around the world at the moment. But as you can see, the distribution of the shark bite incidents isn't even. Australia and the USA have higher numbers than anywhere else in the world. But wouldn't it be interesting if we could actually try to determine the distribution of shark bite per capita of time spent in the water? It would probably be a very, very different situation to this. Now, I'm tired of hearing comparisons between shark bite and bee stings or lightning strikes or the chances of having a car accident. What we really should be doing is trying to compare apples with apples. So let's look at drownings. In Australia, we had 315 drownings last year in 2011. 35 of those were at ocean beaches. In other words, shark territory. Only four shark fatalities that year. And over the last 20 years, in fact, the annual average has only been one fatality a year. And sure, this year, you know, in Western Australia, of course, there has been a little bit of a bumper season. Um, <laughs> but I, I believe this is an anomaly. And next year, it will be back down to the normal levels that we would expect. We only have to think back, for example, to 2008-9, the so-called Summer of the Sharks, where we had all sorts of bizarre theories being bounded around as to why people were being bitten. I, we, I got told there were more sharks in the water than ever before. In fact, the minister got accused that if he didn't do something about it, there would be blood on his hands. Now, you know, all of that was nonsense. And luckily, as I predicted, the, the incidents in New South Wales decreased back down to normal levels again the following year. But are all sharks actually dangerous? Well, no. There's three shark species that are represented more than any of the others in the shark attack statistics. And I call them the big three. That's the bull shark, the tiger shark, and of course, the great white. Now, not very long ago, even we scientists weren't really sure how to interact with those species. Here you can see a diver interacting with a large tiger shark. A couple of years ago, that would have been inconceivable. You know, it, it's been the tour operators, the dive charter boat operators, and the filmmakers around the globe, and especially in South Africa, that have pushed our envelope of comfort as to how we can actually interact. Here we see a diver interacting with a bull shark, something that in Australia we really fear. This was the culprit that bit Paul de Gelder in Sydney Harbour and caused us to have an amazing experience tagging the sharks that are swimming around in the harbour. The video footage here actually shows you some black tip, common black tip sharks considered to be potentially dangerous in the USA. And of course, here we've got the daddy of them all, the great white, interacting with the diver, a cameraman, out of a cage. And you can see that it is possible to interact with all these different species of shark without a cage and, in fact, to be quite safe about it. Now, I remember when we started tiger shark diving back in South Africa, and we used to hide in this cave at 16 meter water depth and burly like crazy and all this fish blood would be in the water, and we'd hid some, some carcasses of, of fish in this crevice in front of us. 
and we'd be sitting there really nervous that the shark would come out of the gloom and sort of see us and go, oh, yum, you know, there's a human, that's what I'm going to go for, forget about the fish. And sure, we did end up often getting tiger sharks coming in, but they would always look like this, they always had their head down and they were sniffing out where that bait was coming from. They completely ignored us. And what was quite fascinating for me was that it wasn't a very good photo opportunity because you always ended up looking at the bum of a shark <laughs> or at least a headless shark. But what was really interesting as a scientist was that these tiger sharks were able to distinguish their preferred fish amongst all that blood in the water and various species of fish as the carcasses in front of it that nose out their non-preferred fish and go for that tasty bit of tuna stuck underneath all the others. So it was fascinating that these sharks were able to do that. So are we really on the menu? Well, the dive operators then decided to take the bait and the burly bucket up to the surface. And that meant that the sharks came up, no more shark bums, and we actually ended up having fantastic dive experiences. And believe it or not, it's now one of the most popular dive sites in the world to interact with large critters like tiger sharks, common black tips, bull sharks, and occasionally the city white sharks. And it's really been a privilege to be able to take divers down there and educate them about sharks. And as a scientist, it's been fascinating to be, to be able to sit there watching how sharks interact with humans. You know, it's, it's, it's been a unique experience to be able to spend hours underwater. And then I was lucky enough to get the opportunity to use the National Geographic Graphic Criticam and deploy it, as you can see I'm doing here, on the fin of the shark and get the shark's eye view of what it was doing down there. How was it using its habitat? How did it search for its prey? And as I asked earlier, are we really on the menu? Well, we, we had a couple of nervous incidents. This is, a, this is an, a, an image, obviously, of a, of a camera carrying shark. And at this time, we were like, uh-oh, you know, is this going to be an accident in the making? But um, it was fascinating. Hours of video footage. Never once did we see a shark trying to bite a human. And even when they approached turtles, which were supposedly their preferred prey for tiger sharks, they would swim right up to them and yet not bite them. So what was going on? This is crazy. Tiger sharks are meant to eat anything that happens in their path. They are the so-called garbage cans of the sea. This is really strange behavior. And what our work is really starting to show is that, in fact, all these sharks are actually very timid and they're very careful in how they approach their prey and what they eat. And I can assure you, humans are not on the menu. But unfortunately, sharks are on the human's menu. There's an average of about 38 million sharks caught per year. This map of the world shows the 20 countries in the world that catch and report the greatest number of shark in their landings of fish to the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization. And it's really quite interesting to see that distribution. Indonesia catches the most, followed by India, and then surprisingly, Spain. Now, these 20 nations combined catch 78% of all the world's shark landings. So, there's a lot of sharks coming out from a very small number of nations in the world. When we look at the waters around Australia, we see that they're reasonably heavily fished. Surprisingly, New Zealand's in there, Indonesia's the highest, but What's really disconcerting is that that patch of water that you can see there of Southeast Asia catches 30% of all the sharks that are caught in the world. And what's another really worrying thing is that gray bit over there called China. China doesn't report any shark-specific product in its fish landings. And yet we know that China is one of the major users of, for example, shark fin. So I'm really convinced that, in fact, it's far more likely that 70 million sharks are killed every year. That's an awful lot of sharks, and our oceans really cannot afford to sustain that sort of a take. Now, in Australia, we're quite fortunate. We have 
various agencies that are world-renowned for managing their shark stocks on their doorsteps, whether it be on the national level or at the state level. But as scientists, it's very difficult to try to entice fisheries managers and the conservationists to sit around the table and to, to come to an agreement as to what sort of levels of commercial shark catch are allowed. And one of the problems is that maybe, and particularly for the more tropical species, maybe the, some of our sharks are heading up north into the waters where they're far more susceptible to capture. And it's only now, through the recent technological advances with using satellite telemetry and, for example, acoustic telemetry, that we're starting to get a handle on the movements of the sharks of Australian waters and being able to then advise our fisheries managers as best methods to make sure that not only do we have a long-term viable shark fishery in Australia, but also that we have a healthy ecosystem. Healthy ecosystems in the marine world are critical, and sharks play a major role in maintaining that ecosystem health. This slide shows you that a habitat with sharks has high diversity, there's a lot of fish life, and there's a good balance. There's been several studies around the world now shown that once you take the apex predator out of the ecosystem, you end up with a less diversity and surprisingly less fish production. And probably one of the best known examples is a scallop fishery that collapsed in the USA. And they couldn't understand why that happened. There was no obvious sign of overfishing of those scallops, so where would they suddenly disappear to? And someone realized that in fact, the cow nose ray population in those waters had boomed. There were now thousands, hundreds and thousands of cow nose rays swimming around eating all the scallops. But why had that happened? And from there, they drew the line to uh, overfishing of common black tip sharks, the predators of the cow nose rays. So basically, there'd been this cascading effect way down the food web from overfishing of sharks to a collapse of the scallop population in those waters. I think it's very clear from these examples from all over the world that it doesn't matter whether you care about sharks or whether you themselves or whether you care about the oceans that they regulate, we need to come up with innovative ideas on how to make fisheries more target specific and how to ensure that species that are unwanted are actually released back into the environment. Now, unfortunately, a human without a limb, well, fortunately, a human without a limb is not going to die. But a shark without its fins is going to die. And it's going to die a slow and torturous death. The practice of shark finning, as it's known, which is cutting the fins off the shark and releasing the live animal back into the water, is abhorrent to pretty much everyone who's seen the photos of it or the video of it. And luckily, those images have caused outcry, and rightly so, have received a lot of media attention. Uh, several countries around the world have now banned the use of shark finning at sea. So now, in those countries, all shark product that is landed has to be whole. The fins have to be attached to the carcass of the shark. That's great, because now, suddenly, we can identify the sharks that are being caught, because identifying individual sharks just from their fins is pretty difficult. Plus, it's filling up the hold in the smaller vessels so they can catch fewer sharks on a fishing trip. So that's also a, a great benefit. But what about the species that, want to be, that aren't wanted? For example, um, it might be a threatened or endangered species. It might be uh, recreational fishers tagging and releasing sharks. It might be a catch over quota, so those sharks need to be released. We are realizing that those species, those situations need attention. We need to be able to get unwanted catch back into the water with minimal damage, and that is the focus of a lot of work, including my own work, down in New South Wales. But how do we do that? How do we actually think of innovative ideas to make shark fisheries more sustainable, keeping the livelihoods of the fishes, but improving the ecosystem. My own work has looked at the use of these things called permanent magnets. 
Now, these are the strongest magnets known to mankind, and I've, I've brought um, two over here, and you can see I'm really battling <laughs> to, to, separate, to separate them. And these are the strongest magnets known, and the idea is that the field that they emit causes aberrations in the shark's magnetoreceptors. And in that way, it'll hopefully stop the sharks from taking the bait off the hook. Now, we, worked, we did some work of the Galapagos Islands, uh, sorry, Galap with Galapagos whalers of Lord Howe Island. I wish we went to Galapagos. Um, <laughs> and uh, it was quite fascinating. We were able to keep individual sharks away from the hooks, but as soon as there were three or more sharks in the area, it became a case of peer pressure, and the shark would take the bait. So, in other words, it was having a situation of, I've got to take the pain to get the gain. So it's not quite that simple to keep sharks safe from humans. What about keeping humans safe from sharks? Well, we've done similar situations with electric uh, receptors in sharks, the ampullae of Lorenzini, as they're known, and I was lucky enough to be involved in the development of the first electric shark repelling device, known as the shark pod. But it took many, many months to try and get the database together that allowed us to actually put a product out there into um, the marketplace. And the tests were all done using this rig, with the bait in the middle and the two electrodes on the side, and then recording how often the great whites would try to come and take the bait. Now, the product has subsequently been miniaturized, and one of the interesting factors, I think, has been that it has never been tested on any of the other species in a scientific manner. So it highlights to me that it's all very well coming up with innovative new ideas on how you can reduce shark-human interactions, but it's actually getting out there and testing them. That's the expensive part and the difficult part. I don't believe that there is a sim silver bullet, a simple single solution. Sharks have evolved over 400 million years into all the different myriad of species that there are. So why do we think that a single solution is going to occur? I think we've got to think out of the box. We need to be thinking of things like the open source concept that the technology people are using. We need to get public involvement in what we're doing. Why are we not using these concepts in the environment and getting that public participation? Not only does it get them involved, but it enhances the knowledge of what the, it is that we ha are trying to save. It's been a long time since we've been able to find anything that we can help to save our sharks. I would like you to listen to these sounds because this is really the call of distress. Thank you very much.